Walking along the shore of Taiwan, with the sea gently washing against its coastline, it's hard not to get a sense of serenity. But 180 kilometers beyond these shores lies an aggressor. One who would do all it can to ensure that this island nation is never recognized on the world stage as an independent state. The People's Republic of China views this land not as a sovereign entity, but rather as a breakaway province of China, one that must be reunified at all costs. But despite only 12 other countries formally recognizing Taiwan, they are still a key ally of the West, one who each year receives billions of dollars in arms sales and is a key link in the global computer chip supply chain. Before I came to this island, I wanted to develop an understanding of its history and how it came to occupy the unique geopolitical position that it holds today. In the radiation-soaked aftermath of the end of the Second World War, Japan was forced to sign a treaty returning all territories acquired during their last 79 years of empire building. This included the island of Taiwan, which reverted back to the ownership of the Republic of China ruled by dictator Chiang Kai-shek. This, however, was to be a short-lived union. China, since 1927, had been in the grips of a civil war between the Nationalist Republic of China and the Communist People's Republic of China, led by Mao Zedong. These two were engaged in a bloody civil war, both vying to lead China. But come 1949, Chiang Kai-shek was losing this war at fast. With his back pushed up against the wall, he needed somewhere for his 1.2 million anti-communist supporters to flee to. After examining several options, including Western China, Kai-shek and the ROC finally set their eyes on the island of Taiwan. The island had high levels of infrastructure left over from Japanese rule and provided a highly defensible base from which they could bide their time and prepare for a counter-attack on the mainland. And so, for over a year before the ROC's final defeat on the mainland, they began ferrying across the Taiwan Strait not just people, but steel, vehicles, ammunition, guns, cultural artifacts, and oh yeah, gold. Lots and lots of gold. About 113 tons by some estimates. Basically, Chiang Kai-shek brought with him everything that you would need for a build-your-own-country starter kit. Mao was not happy to leave his adversary to become entrenched in this island off his doorstep and began amassing troops to cross the Taiwan Strait and put an end to the fight that began all the way back in 1927. But elsewhere in Asia, another fight was developing that would put an end to all of that. When war broke out on the Korean Peninsula, the region became a new front in the tug of war between communism and capitalism. As they had been in Korea, the Americans were keen not to see the further spread of communism in Asia, and so they formed an alliance with the ROC and forced Mao to back down. So there they were, the two Chinas. The Republic of China confined to Taiwan, and the People's Republic of China installed in their new capital in Beijing, both sizing each other up from across the Taiwan Strait. From this point on, they would not be locked in a traditional war of bombs and bullets, but rather one for recognition. For this next bit, we need to know a little about how the idea of statehood works. All around the world, there are many places that claim to be countries, but aren't. Anyone can make a claim that their bit of land is a country, but that's kind of irrelevant. The important point is, do others agree that you are? One of the main acid tests for statehood is if you're given a seat at the UN. For most of the world, the original government of China, the ROC, remained its official leaders. But as the decades went by, it became clear that Chiang Kai-shek would not be returning to retake the mainland and amidst worsening relations with the Soviet Union. America's position started to shift. So first of all, in 1971, the US allowed the passage of a UN resolution confirming the People's Republic of China as the one true China. And then, actually, you know what? Let's go back to the studio for a while. I've got a few things I want to show you. So, this is a print of the New York Times from the 17th of December, 1978. I love getting my hands on real material like this. It makes me feel like I'm really there. That year, the United States shifted their recognition of the one true China from the Republic of China in Taipei to the People's Republic of China in Beijing. 
The Americans, however, just because they were strategically shifting their recognition of China, were not ready to abandon Taiwan altogether. And that's where our next document comes in. Early next year, they passed the Taiwan Relations Act. There are a number of key parts in here which lay out what their attitude to Taiwan would be going forwards. So first of all, they commit to helping Taiwan to maintain a sufficient self-defense capability. In another section, they also state that any effort to determine the future of Taiwan by other than peaceful means would be of grave concern to the United States. You'll notice when reading this, however, that there's one thing the act doesn't do, and that's give an explicit promise to militarily protect Taiwan in the wake of an invasion. This evasiveness is very much by design, to the point that it even has its own name. It's known as strategic ambiguity. Basically, America doesn't want China to know what their response would be, in the hope that they would behave on the assumption that America would intervene. Anyway, there's one last document which I want to show you before we get back to exploring Taiwan. This is a 2005 Chinese law known as the Anti-Succession Law. When you read this document, it provides a pretty stark message to Taiwan. But it's this section here that really caught my eye. It reads, in the event that the Taiwan independent successionist forces should by any means cause Taiwan's succession from China, or the possibilities for a peaceful reunification should be completely exhausted, the state shall employ non-peaceful means to protect China's sovereignty and territorial integrity. In other words, if Taiwan was to formally declare independence, by this law, China would be legally compelled to invade. <laughs> right, anyway, so that's enough paperwork for the time being. Let's get back to exploring Taiwan. There's a concept rooted deep in the psyche of China known as Banyan Gu Qi, which translates to the century of humiliation, basically because of the division and domination exerted on China by outside forces during the 19th and 20th centuries, China is exceptionally protective of its borders and its sense of national integrity. Because of this, and for other reasons which I'll get to later, despite having attained the recognition of the world, China's obsession with reuniting with Taiwan persisted, but the manner that they would go about trying to do this started to shift. As both economies on either side of the strait started developing, China spotted an opportunity to force Taiwan to the negotiating table without firing a single bullet. Beijing's plan was to develop closer economic ties with the island to the point that it would become economic suicide to resist deeper and deeper ties, so that eventually Taiwan would be forced into accepting some kind of political unification. But while the economic ties between the two lands grew deeper, a cultural rift started to appear. At the start of the 80s, both sides of the strait were run by dictatorial regimes, but over the decade, through both internal and external pressures, slowly Taiwan started to liberate. Against all odds, by the end of the 90s, Taiwan had managed to transform itself into a thriving liberal democracy. This is a far cry from the mainland, whose citizens lack even the most basic rights to free speech, let alone the right to vote. Having this thriving beacon for democracy flourishing just off the coast of mainland China is one more reason why they are so determined to reunite with Taiwan. And this cultural rift is only growing wider. In 2021, only 2.7% of Taiwanese citizens identified as uniquely Chinese. So given Taiwan's history and its drastically different direction to China, I guess the question that's on everybody's mind is will Xi Jinping invade? I'm gonna make a prediction here and I hope to hell that I'm correct, but I believe that at the moment, the likelihood of a full-scale invasion is slim and here's why. Firstly, I think that what's happened recently between Russia and Ukraine has actually put Taiwan in a safer position. This is because one of Putin's assumptions was that the West's response to his invasion wouldn't be that strong, but he was wrong. Very, very wrong. It's just like wrong. This is wrong. The West, by and large, did rally to Ukraine's side, and they were willing to suffer their own hardships in order to do so. I think that she will be looking at Taiwan and thinking it very likely that NATO would not sit by and let an invasion go without consequences. 
Secondly, China has experienced one of the most rapid economic booms of any nation in history. One of the ways that they've managed to do this is through large amounts of trade with the rest of the world. A key tactic of the West to strike back against Russia was through the use of sanctions, severing the trading ties that tied it economically to the rest of the world. Similar moves against China would be equally, if not more, devastating than they were against Russia. I'm banking on the fact that Xi would not deem it worthwhile to decimate China's economic growth for the sake of a small island. And my last reason is this, Taiwan is not Ukraine. Ukraine was connected to Russia by 2,000 kilometers of border, whereas Taiwan is separated from mainland China by 180 kilometers of treacherous ocean. Even if China was able to reach Taiwan in the short window that the seasons allow for, there are only 13 viable beaches on which they could stage a landing, and they are all heavily defended. So given the fact that Taiwan has existed for almost three quarters of a century under the constant threat of Chinese invasion, what kind of country has it turned into? Well, despite starting its life in fairly adverse circumstances, Taiwan has managed to turn itself into a thriving liberal democracy. Sometimes a little too thriving, if you ask me. And the youth of Taiwan have sent a pretty clear message about the direction they want their country to take, both inside and outside the ballot box. They've seen the promise of one country, two systems, completely destroyed in Hong Kong, and they're not willing to see the same happen here. In 2014, they even went as far as to occupy the legislature in what became known as the Sunflower Movement in order to block a free trade agreement with China. Taiwan has also set itself apart from China on various progressive issues. For instance, they were the first country in Asia to legalize same-sex marriage. This is a controversial topic, but I do believe that Taiwan should be allowed the right to self-determination the same as any other country. I know why China believes it to be a separatist province, but their reasoning is based on a revisionist take on history that ignores the fact that the People's Republic of China, as it exists today, has never actually owned the island of Taiwan. When you explore Taiwan for yourself, from the bustling markets full of amazing street food to the beautiful temples, you start to get a sense of its rich culture, both at the same time Chinese, but also something wholly unique and to its own. It's been the perfect exclamation point to an already amazing trip. I've loved exploring this country both as a tourist and as a filmmaker. If you find yourself with any time to spend in Asia, then I definitely recommend checking it out. Thanks for watching.